beg, borrow, but don't steal. How to create a great PowerPoint without breaking the law. A presentation by Alvin Trusty at the eTech Ohio 2008 conference. I found out yesterday this wasn't an hour, it was 45 minutes. So I'll have to talk really fast. Here are all of my links. <laughs> Write these down real quick. All right. If you miss those, go to this URL. Write this one down. It's just delicious with my username, which is a trustee, and my tag, like everyone who presents at this conference should do, but no one ever does, is etechohio08. I'm sorry, I can only stay eight seconds on each side. This is my email address. If you forget that delicious link, email me, and I'll send it to you. Most of you will do that. And if you can remember anything, remember my name. And if you go to my blog address, you'll remember that. If you search Alvin Technology in Google, I'm the first one. How's that? On with what I want to talk about. I am not a lawyer. So if you take what I say back to your school and you apply it as gospel, you may end up in jail. <laughs> Talk to your school's lawyer before you do anything questionable that deals with copyright. But I will give you a lot of resources so you can research a lot of things on your own. I am a professor at the University of Finley. Uh, here's the university's web address. If you go to that web address and you type keyword edtech, you'll find all of the information about my program. Uh, I teach all of my classes online. So if you'd like to pick up a couple graduate credits to renew a license, or you know a teacher who'd like to do that, come and take an online class. Let's start with a survey. Raise your hand if you think this is legal. I would like to hear a song, so I go to the library, and I borrow a CD so that I can listen to it. Is that legal? I have a record album, a vintage original Beatles white, but it's an LP on vinyl. I want to get it onto my iPod. I don't have it on CD. I go to the library, I borrow the CD, which I own the album, and I rip it to my iPod. Is that legal? Wow, no one says it. <laughs> one guy up front. <laughs> I wanted to watch a movie on HBO last night, but I was stuck here watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> so I set my TiVo to burn the HBO movie to a DVD so I could watch it later. Is that legal? Just a few people, All right? But I forgot to set my TiVo. My neighbor, he set his TiVo. When I get home, I'm going to borrow that DVD and make myself a copy. <laughs> All right? Because I forgot. I could have, but I forgot. How, is that legal? No one. You guys are either scared to raise your hand. I'm not videotaping this. <laughs> <laughs> but my neighbor, his TiVo had an air. So instead of using the DVD that he recorded, I went to Blockbuster, rented, I paid for it, I rented the movie, brought it home, made a copy so I could watch it when I want to watch it. Raise your hands if you think that's legal. Did you give it to your neighbor? <laughs> I left my neighbor out of the loop. Not very many people think that's legal. One guy. All right. Let's uh, take it into the classroom. I have this very expensive book, and I want to show some of my students a picture in this book. This is a copyrighted book, but I hold it up in front of my class so they can see it. Is that legal? Raise your hand if you think it's legal. Not everybody. Okay, the people in the back, they can't quite see. So I take this book, which is a copyrighted book, put it on an Elmo, and I project it onto a screen so the people in the back can see it. Is that legal? Two students are absent. So I take the book, and I scan the page that I showed my class, and I put it into Moodle or Blackboard. Is that legal? Only a couple people think that's legal. Did you include bibliography? 
Well, there's a difference between copyright and plagiarism. You would be talking about plagiarism. Here's one you can all relate to. It's the last day of classes before Christmas break. <laughs> half of my students are in exams. Half have a free day. So I send them to the cafeteria and we watch on the big screen Christmas vacation. Is that legal by copyright law? Oh, wait. How many schools have done that? <laughs> All right. All right. Half of this talk is going to be about copyright. Half of it is going to be about how to create a good presentation. If you had seen the questions that I just asked in another presentation, they may have looked a little more like this. Someone may have written out the questions, but this is kind of a crummy uh, template. They probably picked a cool background picture. Uh, uh, this is my old favorite, but since this is an educational conference, they probably used, they used the one with the crayons on it. And then, if you think it's legal, it's got to fly in, right? right? What if I ask the second question, I drop it down from the top. The third question, I can ask by making the thing whip in, and then my favorite is the third question, which does the little twirl. Now, you guys are really engaged by that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's always this dumb bullet. Why does every slide you ever make have a bullet in front of every sentence? It's because the template that's in Microsoft PowerPoint, it's called PowerPoint, or bullet point, it's built into the template. And no one wants to take the time to figure out how to get rid of the, the bullet point, so every second slide has a bullet point in front of it. But it turns out that this bullet point can be removed really easily. If you edit your slide, boom. It's gone, right? If you edit your slide, you can hit the backspace. That's tough, right? Bullet gone. But now my paragraph is outdated, so I have to hit the tab, take it back. No more bullet, and my slide looks right. You can actually go into the master slide and adjust right here, adjust the tab, and you can get rid of that bullet for good by making the tabs equal. Then all you have to do is delete the bullet. You don't even have to hit the tab. What version of Office is that? This is Office 2007. It all works the same in 2003, back to 97. Now, if you want to put a background picture on every one of your slides, all it's going to do is make your slide to where it's harder to read. The slide's much more legible if you have a high contrast text on a, the opposite is background. And I'll talk about color more later. Also, under no circumstances should you ever read your slides word for word from the presentation screen. Your audience will figure out that you're reading the slides. They can read faster than you can talk. This will create a disconnect between you and your audience. <laughs> I'm upset about that. This came from Guy Kawasaki. He has a YouTube video, which is one of my delicious links heretofore called My Delicious Links, which I've already showed you the URL. The research also shows, and you're going to love this, if you read your slides to an audience, they don't remember it as well as if you just show them the text. So you're better off, if you want the people to remember things, shipping the PowerPoint presentation with the words and not showing up. <laughs> They'll remember it more. <laughs> also, there is absolutely no reason for you to ever use a bullet point in your presentation. I have 327 slides in this presentation. That is a school net record. I broke my own self-established record two years ago, 303 slides. There are no bullet points in anywhere except where I showed you how to get rid of a bullet point in this entire presentation. And it's an okay presentation. <laughs> Did you guys hear that okay? Yeah. This, is, uh, this is Buzz. He called me on Saturday. He says, could you put my picture in your presentation? <laughs> I said, okay. He always put sounds in the backgrounds of his PowerPoint for no good reason, just to like, wake people up. Buzz, you might recognize from last year, if you saw my presentation, he was the main character in the If Class Were Like a Chat video, also in My Delicious Links. Change gears again. Let me talk a little bit about visual design. This is what everyone should understand when they go to create a PowerPoint presentation, how things work. So the first thing is figure the ground contrast. This is where you have some distinction between the figure, which is the words, which you cannot see, and the ground, which is the back. 
If I take this slide, I make this go over the black, like I did when I showed this slide, very legible. It's also why this particular template is terrible, because you have this white text over top of this reflection on the ocean. You have this light-colored blue over top of a light-colored sky. Very poor figure-to-ground contrast. Also, when it comes to fonts, there are two main kinds of fonts that you will see in the whole world. One of them is serif, has these little boots on everything. The other one, without serifs. Serif fonts are used in printing, books, tests, things that are printed on paper. Sans serif fonts are used in presentations like PowerPoint. This is a picture of Steve Jobs giving his keynote address two weeks ago at Macworld. He used all Helvetica. Helvetica is so good, someone just made a movie called Helvetica. Seriously. You do not need more than two fonts. If you take a desktop publishing class, sometimes they will limit you to <laughs> one font. And it has to be big. Big does two things. The people in the back can see it. And it also keeps the number of words that are on your slide to a minimum. And you don't want to read your slides ever. Also, never under any circumstances use Comic Sans. <laughs> this is actually a third kind of font. It's an artsy font. It's great if you're going to make a logo. But any kind of uh, material you want people to read and comprehend, it's, uh, it's bad. There's a whole industry trying to get rid of it. Right. For the color, you want high contrast colors, which I talked about with figure ground contrast. But you've got to be careful. White on black, like this slide is, or black on white are very good. Some people say slightly yellow instead of white is even better. But you want high contrast. You can also do a little bit of a, a blend but make sure, again, you have high contrast over the course of the whole slide so you can put your text anywhere on the slide you want. You can also use analogous colors, a dark blue with a very light blue, or the opposite. You want to stay away from complementary colors of the same value. Blue and orange are complementary, but if I lighten the blue, darken the orange, then they become very usable. So you can use complementary colors as long as they're not the same value. This is one you want to stay away from as well, not only because they're the same value, this is one that colorblind people can't see. So if you can't see this slide, you're colorblind. <laughs> but you will all use this because these are our Christmas, Christmas kind of colors, right? About clip art, throw on a piece of clip art in, I've, you, you just shouldn't. If you have these guys on a slide, they better have dialogue. Otherwise, they're just not going to add anything to your slide. Also, when it comes to capitalization, you want to use proper capitalization because your brain can look at the top of those letters and read the words without saying the bottom part of the word. If you use all caps, I have a five-letter personal rule. Some people say four, some people say six. But if you use all caps, you should have a very limited number of letters total. Now, if you don't believe me, what does this say? Easy to read, right? Because you can see the tops of the letters. How about this? It took quite a bit longer, though. But you really had to think, what does that say? You never want to do this. This is what our children do on their MySpace pages. It takes your brain much longer to comprehend what that says because of the incorrect capitalization. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about are in this book. I held it up already. It's called Universal Principles of Design. Your local library probably has a copy. I checked it out so many times I just bought a copy for myself. Um, I also read this guy's <laughs> blog presentations in, which is very good. Uh, Edward Tuff is uh, probably one of the foremost PowerPoint guys. Uh, and this one, you just, you got to like the title, right? Now, by the way, I have links to all four of those books and my delicious links. So you don't have to write them down. Uh, favorite quote out of this book. PowerPoint is so easy I learned it in 15 minutes. 
But that's most of the professional development that people have is 15 minutes. I mastered PowerPoint. It took 15 minutes. I know how to do everything. And your PowerPoint looks like you took 15 minutes to learn PowerPoint. So how did I do some of those things you might not have seen before? Remember the old overhead projector? You didn't want to show the whole class the whole thing, so you slid a piece of paper over part of it. I did that trick in PowerPoint. I drew a box, and I slid that box over part of that. That's how I made half a word. And it's pretty easy to do. It's built right into PowerPoint. You can add a shape. Over there is my little don't use this for a comic sans. Up here are all the rectangles. I drew a rectangle. I made the rectangle white. You can adjust it and make the format the edge line to make it white. And once I did that, I put it over top there. To make the uh, little circles appear on this, I used two slides. What I did is I made a slide. I use a technique called copy and mod modify. So made this slide, made a copy, added circles to that one, and then I did a transition, fade smoothly between those two slides. Made it look like those little circles just appeared. You really only need two transitions in your PowerPoint, and they don't fly around. You need the one that I just showed you, the fade smoothly, and another handy one, is, especially if you have black backgrounds, is the fade through black. You don't really need any other transition. It's just going to distract the people who are watching your presentation. Uh, by the way, in my delicious links, if my explanation isn't good enough, I have links to Microsoft tutorials that tell you how to do every one of these little things that I'm going to talk about. Go to my delicious links. They're all marked as PowerPoint in addition to eTech Ohio 08, so you can read through these in detail. Another common mistake, and I used to make this one myself, is to go into a presentation you want to do a live internet. I am not even plugged into the network because there's just too many things that can go wrong with it. The network can be slow. It might not work. You never know. I don't use live internet when I do a presentation. If I want to talk about something on the internet, these are my delicious links, which I've already showed you. You wrote that down, right? I do a screen capture and I put it into my presentation. Here you can see where I found some of my pictures, tutorials. I'll talk about videos. Here's the book out on Amazon. Here's copyright law from the U.S. government copyright law page. All of those are on the Internet. It appeared that I went to the Internet, but that I screen captured ahead of time. Very simple technique. I use a, a free program called Earthenview. Download it for free up for a PC, and it will save all of your screen captures to a file. You can just hit the print screen on your computer. On your Mac, I think it's uh, Control-Shift-3 or Control-Shift-4. But there are programs that will do some uh, fancier things. You need to know one thing, though. This screen is 1024 by 768 pixels. Before I get ready to capture a bunch of screens, I made this page. This page is 1024 wide, that line right there, 768. I, there's a link to it in my delicious links. I go to this page, adjust my browser so I know that it's big enough, and then I start taking my screen captures. So let's talk about copyright law. It's under Title 17 of the U.S. Code, and it gives an owner of a copyright the right to reproduce, prepare derivatives, distribute copies, perform publicly, display publicly, and display electronically. Those are the rights of a copyright holder. So in other words, if I want to distribute something, I cannot unless I own the copyright. But there is something that's called the first sale doctrine. In other words, if I'm the library and I buy a CD, or if I'm Blockbuster and I buy a DVD, that's the first sale. The copyright owner controls that. But once I own a particular copy, once I buy a book, a CD, a DVD, I can do with that whatever I'd like because I have a copy. But I am not allowed to perform it publicly. So if you're in the cafeteria watching a movie, unless it is a movie that is not licensed for the private use of the audience, you've heard that before, so you can get movies that are licensed this way, but you have to go out of your way to do it 
and guarantee the movies they have in your school are just DVDs from Blockbuster or somebody brought one in from home. They're not licensed that way. So how was that done? This is the... Making those little lines show up under there, this is the most used technique that I use. It's an animation. So I draw a line, click animation, and over here I can add an effect. I use this fade in a lot because I can show you a picture and then by pushing the button I can make one piece come to the front. You can also tell it to show up when you click, show up when the previous action happened, or after the previous action. So when I went perform publicly, here was the first one and then the other one was the last option after previous. So it looked like two things that showed up there. To copyright something, it has to be fixed. By fixed, I mean it has to be written down, recorded, or saved on some sort of tape, uh, film, or hard drive. Any one of those things makes the work fixed, and it makes it copyright protected. That's all you have to do. There's no paperwork. How long does a copyright last? Well, I can show this to you in a couple of ways. I took the data that shows all the way back to the Founding Fathers copyright of 14 years up to 1998 of 105 years, and I put it in this graph. Graphs are handy, but sometimes it's more effective if you show that same information in a graph. And if you really want to get dramatic, you could, you know, do this and this and, you know, do that whole little deal there if you want to. If you've never seen this video... Now, thousands years of CO2 in the mountain glaciers, that's one thing. But in Antarctica, they can go back 650,000 years. This incidentally uh, is the first time that anybody outside of a small group of scientists has seen this image. And I apologize, it's a little bit dark, but if you want to see a great presentation with absolutely no bullet points, watch this movie. A gr incredible presentation. It won an Academy Award. It doesn't matter if you agree with it. Just watch it to see how different things are presented. Here's another graph. I saw this at a conference last year, and I thought, you know, this message was displayed very well because of this graph. So I recreated this graph. What I did is I went back and I just drew all these little things and made my own version. See, this is all the jobs in the world. These are the ones that are routine work. Hostesses, uh, assembly line people. Some of that's done by people, some by machines. This is the group you want to be in. This is creative work. Designers, researchers, teachers. But here's the thing. These are the people in the United States. These are developing country. And this line is moving up. A message communicated very well because of that chart, which was actually pretty easy to make. I used tools built right into PowerPoint, and I drew myself each one of these slides. I used, again, the copy and modify, made this one, copied it right on down the line, and then when I was finished, I used a fade to smooth between each one to make it appear that that graphic built itself. Here it is, played back, super slow motion. To be protected by copyright, something does not have to have this symbol. If you don't see this, it doesn't mean anything today. And there was a time it did. This is a picture outside of the Indianapolis Art Museum. And this piece of work, created by Robert Indiana, apparently laid on the couch a long time because he forgot to copyright his work. Which means it's the most abused piece of modern art ever. All of these things are direct copies or, in this case, a parody of his work. And they happen because he didn't copyright them, that particular work. Today, to copyright something, all you have to do is fix it. Once it's fixed, copyright automatically. So this uh, little technique, I put all the pictures on here, and then I have one after another uh, fade in. All right? That's all I did for that one. And like I said, fixed means protected by copyright. You don't have to file a piece of paperwork anymore. You don't have to. If you want to use a copyright protected work, you need to get written permission. 
And here's an example from Education World on a template that you can use to get such permission. Fortunately, there's a whole other scope called fair use. And fair use gives you some exemptions where you can use copyrighted material without written permission from the copyright holder. For criticism, comment, look at that, teaching. So for teaching, I can use something without the written permission of a copyright holder. But there's one very important thing about fair use. It's a defense. It's not a right. Which means when it comes down to it, if the copyright owner says, you are infringing, you're going to court. You can't just throw your hands up and say, I'm a teacher, it's fair use. You have to go to court and prove it's fair use. And the court will look at four factors. And the factors are, how did you use the work? Did you just photocopy it, the whole thing, so pass it out to your class? Or did you take the work and transform it, is the word that they use? Did you make something new, some, help your students understand something they could not have understood by just looking at the original work? The second thing is, was it an encyclopedia? Facts are not copyrightable. Ideas are not copyrightable. They can be patented but they can't be protected by copyright. A dramatic work, a play, a fiction book, those are very expressive, very original, much more protected by copyright. The third thing is how much you used. And there is no law that says how much you are allowed to use. It's not written anywhere. What I have read in a lot of case study is the court will say more than 5% was used. That seems, they seem to say 5%. But it's not always, and there's nowhere in the law where it says how much you're allowed to use. The more you use, the less likely it is fair use. And the last thing is the most important. How does it affect the uh, money that can be made by the copyright holder? If you're saying, I'm a teacher, this is fair use, but you're photocopying a textbook so your school doesn't have to buy a textbook, you're drastically affecting the market of the copyright holder, and it would probably not be fair use. You should also learn about the Technology, Education, and Copyright Harmonization Act, otherwise known as the TEACH Act. The TEACH Act says I can take a page out of my history book, scan it, and put it into a protected system like Moodle or Blackboard because the whole world doesn't have access to that. TEACH deals with distance education. That's the, the main part of that particular law. You probably saw that last night. All right. Look, it says, any descriptions or accounts. The NFL is trying to say, you're not allowed to talk about this game with our expressed written permission. <laughs> All right. And as my dad would say, <laughs> so I go online and I do some research and I find last year's Super Bowl that very same snippet is out there on YouTube wide open to the public and I found out that it was put there by this lady her name is Wendy Seltzer and she's a teacher in her class she was talking about fair use and copyright and she put that video out there on YouTube you know what happened the NFL came along and said that's copyrighted by the NFL. They gave them what's called a takedown notice. And so YouTube had to take it offline. But see, Wendy, she's a professor of law at the Brooklyn Law School. <laughs> and she understands Section 512 of the DMCA Safe Harbor. In fact, she has a web page that will tell you how you can write a counter notice to YouTube. And if you're too dumb to figure out how to do this, she just set up a website where she has this counter notification form. You check those boxes, put your name in there, and you can do a counter notice. So she used her form, and she sent YouTube a counter notice. Said, put it back online. They put it back online. You'd think it'd be over, but this is the NFL, right? <laughs> the NFL does a second takedown notice and says, you know, we really mean it. Take it offline. And Wendy says, wait, you know, 
I'm a professor of law, book in law school, that's not the way it works. If I do a counter notice, the only way YouTube can take that offline is if the NFL takes me to court and the court orders that it be taken offline. So the NFL wasn't about to take it to court. So guess what YouTube had to do? Put it back online. Okay. There's a lot you can do with fair use. You shouldn't, re you shouldn't believe everything that you read. This is probably at the front of every movie you've ever seen. At least it says you're not allowed to do unauthorized. So they soften a little by saying, there may be an exception, but we're not going to say what it is. There's a great little video. There's a link to it in my delicious links. Called A Fairy Use Tale, which is a parody of Disney. And at the beginning of the video, they have this little gem. This says, there are certainly times when you can use copyright protected work without the written permission of the copyright holder. And at the bottom there, it says, this is called fair use. There's also another fair use called time shifting. This is when you're going to be gone. So you set your TiVo to record something, burn it to a DVD so you can watch it later. Perfectly legal, according to the court case I had on the previous page. But one of the exclusive rights of the copyright holder is reproduction, making copies of a work. So if I go to my neighbor and I try to get his copy and make a copy, even though he could legally record TV to a DVD, he's not legally allowed to make a copy of that work. Another thing related to technology is space shifting. This lets you take a CD and rip it to an MP3 player. It's called space shifting. Again, there's another case that makes that something that's also legal. But you should read about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This act, which is about 2000 or so, says that if you use, develop, or distribute an anti-circumvention tool, you're breaking the law even if you think you're using fair use. What that means is if something is scrambled and you try to descramble it, if it's encrypted, you try to decrypt it, or if you distribute a tool that does that or make a tool that does that, you're not playing by the fair use rules. So if you go to Blockbuster, all of the DVDs are encrypted. So if you try to make a copy, which is fair use, if you own a DVD, you could make a backup, fair use. But to do that, if you have to break that digital tool, you're breaking the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which makes you guilty of a different law. Also, if you get something from iTunes, they have DRM. That's Digital Rights Management. It's another technological lock that makes it to where you can't give that song to someone else to play on their uh, iPod. And then there's piracy, which has changed over the years. You guys, you guys remember Death Blow? We have a show business is here. All right, here we go. Death Blow. Hey. What the hell is he doing? Perhaps he does that all the time. making a copy of the movie for sale on the street. Hmm? Making a copy of uh, the movie for sale on the street. Now this episode, which is called Little Kicks of Fate, 1996, and it came along about four years before Napster. See, that episode of Seinfeld, that guy took that tape and he made a few copies, sold it on the street. Now someone can take that same movie and distribute it over peer-to-peer -peer networking to thousands or millions of people without even having to buy the tapes to sell on the street, which is why we see these changes like the DMCA. <laughs> if you're going to use video in your PowerPoint, there's a little video icon right at the main uh, template. The only thing you should do is make sure that your video plays automatically when the slide starts. Otherwise, you have to walk over to the presentation and click it to make it play. It just complicates it. So let's talk about Creative Commons. This is a whole set of licensing designed to let you reserve some of your rights. 
Here's the main website. It's in the delicious links. And they have all of these different pieces of content which are very limited in how they're protected. They have uh, audio, tons of audio. They have, they have video. And again, each one of these is a provider that has all of this content. Images. and text, as well as a lot of educational work. And it's called Creative Commons. Some rights reserved is their little trademark. If I license something Creative Commons, I basically relinquish all of my copyright except for things that don't apply to a particular license. If I license it with attribution, it means my work can be used by you without permission to do anything as long as you give me credit. All you have to do is give me credit. The rest of these add different things. They can be non-commercial. You can use it for anything unless you're making money. You can do the share, share alike. You can use it for anything, but if you use it, your work has to be licensed Creative Commons share alike. Or you can say no derivatives, which means you can use my whole song, but you can't remix it. If you want to use it as background music in your PowerPoint, that's fine. But don't do a new song with bits of my song. And then there are some which have double dose. Flickr is by far the biggest site with images for Creative Commons licensed pictures. So if you go to the Creative Commons, it's just flickr.com slash Creative Commons, you can see attribution, attribution of derivatives, all these different licenses. And there are 6 million, 2 million, 20 million, 8 million, 16 million, 4 million. There are 58 million pictures in Flickr that are free to use without contacting the author. So if you can't find a decent picture in all of those, Now, how did I do that? This is a really cool thing. I captured this big, long screen and made it scroll. To use it, I used a, a program I downloaded for free. I have a delicious link that tells you where you can get this. It's called Snagit, and it will let you do a scrolling window. So I captured this big, long window. These are all my delicious links, and then I made it scroll. To do that, I put the picture into PowerPoint, and then I added an animation, custom animation, which is a motion path, move it up. Once I did that, it gave me it gave me this little line. Here's where it starts, here's where it ends. I just make it scroll more by making that line longer. And again, here's what it looks like when you scroll it. Um, you can also stop it. So let's say that I wanted this to scroll, and then I wanted to stop and show you my link to snag it. All I did was do a second motion and then it starts up again after that goes away. Simple animation. If you don't like to look at Flickr 10 pictures at a time, you can go to Flickr Leach. It shows 200 pictures at a time. Flickr CC shows only Creative Commons pictures, and it lets you pick a picture and then edit that picture. That means this right here, you can edit that picture. And there's another neat little technique. You like how I made everything disappear? This, uh, again, it's make a page, make a copy. I have a picture. I crop this, so I only have that little picture. I save that. I take my original, and I make it darker. It's built right into PowerPoint. That gives me this dark. These lights are bright. Otherwise, this looks a little bit better. I then take my picture, and I put it on top of my dark picture, draw a box around it, and then I do a fade smoothly transition. It makes it look like this picture has everything disappear except that one little part. Here it is, full screen. Uh, here it is on a page that I've already shown you. So it's a nice little technique that you can do to draw attention when you really want to draw attention to one little part of your slide. <laughs> Here's another site that lets you type in a word like classroom, and then you can say, show me a classroom that looks like a cloud, or it looks like a field, and it'll find pictures that match those criteria. It's an interesting little thing. These are pictures, when I typed in classroom and Flickr, these are pictures that came up under Creative Commons. 
And each one of these pictures, if you go to Flickr and you can see some rights reserved, if I want to use one of those pictures in my presentation, all I have to do is copy the URL and then in my PowerPoint put that URL somewhere. That's attribution. I'm, a, I'm giving the creator of that work the copyright that he wanted, which was just attribution. Now, you can also do it this way. Here are all those pictures with all of the links to them. Another way of giving attribution. I will. No, I mean... You could, yeah. I'll, I'll do that at the end. Now, in addition to all those things that are out there, Creative Commons, there's a ton of stuff that's in the public domain already. In fact, anything created by the government or an agent working for the government is public domain. So this photo is public domain. All the moon stuff is. There's some great shots from outer space. And you can use these in interesting ways. Here I've taken that photo and I've put it as a part of my slide with some words. But you have to be careful. If I was using a template that had like a blue background, that would look funny. It would like if I had a white background, that wouldn't look nearly as good as having a black background like that. So choose your background so that your picture you have on there looks like it's part of the page, not a picture added to the page. That's the kind of animations you'll see all the time here, right? And again, it's a custom animation, and in this time I did a motion path curve. Once you do that, it's easy to take that, copy it. You can put that on every slide if you wanted to. Really easy to do. The rule of thirds. If you take a picture and you draw lines to divide it three by three, where those lines intersect is where your eye will focus when you look at the picture. If I have this picture, my eye focuses here on those parts. So you want to line up your pictures so that you take advantage of the way people's brains work. You've seen pictures that, that use this all the time. This is the most reproduced photograph in the history of photography. And if you look at it, you can see nice rule of thirds. Television or movies, they never have the person in the center. They're always a little bit off because of the rule of thirds. When I picked this picture, I just made sure I put that little earth at the spot that it would show up rule of thirds. Interview. Wow, I made it. No templates. You just don't need a template. You certainly don't need bullets. You should let your pictures talk for you. Create a lot of slides. That way you have to read fewer slides. Practice, practice, practice. I have to show you this. I'm, I spent a lot of money to buy an iPod. This is an iPod Touch. So I'm continually showing my wife new ways that I can use it in education. So this is my entire PowerPoint presentation. One by one. And I can practice with this. See, I didn't have to carry around a laptop. I just go like this. Isn't that cool? <laughs> but what? But, uh, I'll, there'll be a drawing. <laughs> Don't try to go to the internet live. Don't use sound effects, but you can use sound effectively. I only use the fade transition, and I use a lot of animation. And take more than 15 minutes to learn how to use PowerPoint. And if you can't find the picture you're looking for on Flickr, you can always just take your clock and take a picture. You know, so you can still be creative in this whole thing. Now, here's what I want you to do. Think about the pictures you've seen and tell me when I give you the attribution. Can you remember what these slides were about?
without using a lot of words, hopefully you were able to remember some of those pictures, and when you leave, have a better idea of what it was that we talked about. There's my contact information, and if you have any questions, our time is a little bit past.